Alright guys, we're tackling ribs this week, and ribs tends to be, <laughs> I call it the most confusing exam ever. Um, it is a little bit confusing as uh, our clinical site has added views in that are in your textbook, um, but we'll talk more about that in lab, okay? So some things to know about ribs, most common cause is strong blunt force trauma to the chest. Uh, a fall, an MVA, hit with a bat, impact, you get the idea, right? Um, your elderly patients who have osteoporosis, something minor, even as minor as coughing, uh, can break a rib. The fracture of the rib itself is rarely serious. Um, the force that's caused um, can cause other problems. They can have a bruised lung um, or a collapsed lung because of pneumothorax. Injury to the lower ribs um, can also sometimes injure or damage the liver or spleen, which can be fairly serious. And then the more ribs that are broken, the more likely the lungs and our other organs will be damaged. Review anatomy, friends. Topic up and your landmarks. This is anatomy uh, for a rib. Know it, live it, love it. Anatomy again. Know how the ribs attach to the sternum, hence the arrow and the highlighted area. <laughs> um, ribs that lie, they lie in oblique plane in the thorax, so the anterior ends are um, three to five inches lower in comparison to the posterior ends. This is an image of how the ribs are attaching to the thoracic vertebrae, articulating areas. There are two joints, the costovertebral joint, costotransverse. These are easily memorized because this joint is touching the transverse process of the vertebrae. This one is touching the vertebrae itself. Don't make it harder than it needs to be, all right? The space in between each of the ribs is called the intercostal spaces. There are um, true ribs and false ribs, and also what we refer to as floating ribs. And the true ribs are the first seven pairs. They attach directly to the sternum itself. And then eight, nine, ten do not attach to the sternum itself, but attach to the cartilage from the seventh rib. And then 11 and 12 are kind of just free floating. They're just in the back here. They don't attach to the um, cartilage or directly. So trying to visualize posterior versus anterior ribs are easier um, if you think of one horizontal and one at an angle. Let me flip back. I went a little ahead of myself here. But I like this image the way it has it um, visualized here. So the posterior ribs are kind of coming straight across. The anterior come in an angle. If you think AA, anterior is at an angle, posterior straight across. The most important question to ask your patient who's coming in for rib x-rays is where is your pain? Because when we're doing a rib series, the pain is supposed to touch the image receptor. So if they have anterior pain, the anterior part of their body is gonna touch the um, image receptor. Posterior pain, posterior touches. Um, you also wanna ask, is it upper pain or lower pain? Because that will determine your breathing instruction. So upper pain is inspiration. You breathe in for upper, out for lower, expiration. We do a lower cone down for the false ribs. We do an AP to decrease um, OID. If you remember, your floating ribs um, are only in the back and they don't actually attach in the front. So we do an AP. Some of your techs or radiologists might prefer you to place a BB and um, it's those little metal nipple markers that we have. Put it on the site of pain. Have the patient put it directly on their skin and not on the gown. Okay, so I'm gonna break down our routines, anterior versus posterior, and for us, if the patient comes in with an order with a chest, then we always start with the chest, and then move on from there. So, left anterior rib pain, we'll start with a PA chest at 72 inches. Move your tube into 40 inches for ribs, all right, and then we're gonna do a straight on PA of the left, because that's our side of interest. I'm going to do an RAO position, but you're going to stay centered with your light over the left ribs because I'm doing the left ribs. 
the RAO position elongates the left ribs. LAO, still centered on the left, I'm going to foreshorten the left ribs. I'm going to do an AP lower cone down to the left using a 10 by 12 cassette. Right anterior, I'm going to flip flop a few of the things. Right anterior rib pain, again, PA chest, 72 inches. Then you're going to move to 40. Don't forget that step to move to 40 inches with your tube. PA of the right, because that's the side of interest. LAO, centered on the right side of the ribs though, is going to elongate my right ribs. RAO, centered on the right, <laughs> is going to foreshorten the right, and then I'm going to do an AP lower cone down. Posterior pain is going to be a little, the only difference is you're going to do posterior obliques instead of anterior obliques. And you're going to do APs instead of PAs because the pain is in the back. The pain is posterior and I want to put the pain to the IR. So I'm going to do an AP of the left, LPO, RPO instead. And again on the right posterior, I'm going to do an AP of the right. And we will go through these multiple times in lab. I spend a lot of time in these in lab, so don't stress about it yet. Axillary rib pain, if they tell you their rib pain is kind of under their armpit area here, you're just going to do the posterior routine, okay? Why do we do a chest x-ray at 72 inches first? We're looking for possible pneumothorax or hemothorax um, from the fractured rib. If the patient has had a chest x-ray within 24 hours, you can skip the chest and only do the rib views. After you do the chest x-ray at 72 inches, move to 40 before you do anything else. This is usually where my students bomb their rib, their rib um, competency. They forget to move to 40. Do it first. Ribs are bony detail. You need that um, SID of 40 inches. And you can see on this image here, the magnification factor from 70 to 40, but you can also see the detail change. All right, don't forget. When you're looking at the side of interest, whether AP or PA, right, you want to center, I call it mid clavicle. Here, we have a small amount of light over his shoulder. We're gonna, where they have their light, I don't love. If you look at my blue line here, this is where kind of I would go. Um, I tend to have light just over the spine and kind of just past the chest wall here. Bring the arm away from their body. You don't want the soft tissue to overlap. Oblique ribs. Textbook only requires one oblique and that's the elongated oblique. But for fun, our clinical site does both obliques. We do a 45 to elongate and a 30 to foreshorten. This foreshortened oblique is not in your textbook. It's one we made up, all right? But for our clinical site, you have to do both. One trick for me that I helps me remember is when you're in PA position, the elongated side is the side away. So PA, pain away, elongates. AP position is the elongated side um, that's closest to the IR. So somebody told me at pain, for their trick for elongated in AP. I just remember one and know it's the reverse. Oblique view, um, so ideally, if you can get all of the ribs on on one image, that's ideal. But if not, we're gonna have to um, see which one we're missing, okay? So ideally, you have all the elongated ribs. You have where the ribs attach to the vertebrae. And then you have a little bit of light past the vertebrae the arm is up and out of the way. The lower cone down ribs um, visualizes the false ribs. We'll do an AP. I use a 10 by 12 lengthwise for most of my patients. If they are a short and wide patient, you might want to go crosswise. The bottom of your light field is just going to go um, right above the iliac crest and up as high as you can get for um, ribs. Okay. Another image here, so this is a image of the BB marker. That's what it looks like. Bilateral ribs, I will go over this in lab, um, but ideally your patient's small enough where you can fit both the obliques on. If not, you're gonna have to do separate obliques left and right, it's a lot of exposures. Here's an example of a good oblique. This side's 
fully elongated, this rib area is foreshortened. Over here, it's not enough of an oblique. It's not really elongating very much, so it's in between here. Technical factors, um, the AP and PA ribs, I tend to use a step up from what I'd use on their shoulder. So if you'd use eight on their shoulder, it might be 10 on ribs. So 10, 12, 16, something around that range. 70, 75 kV. When I do an oblique that pulls the part away from the IR, I increase my MAS a step. The lower cone down, I use abdomen technique. If you're doing bilateral ribs, you're gonna need to step it up a little bit. Trauma or elderly patients, um, for ribs, I always utilize my, um, my bucky table. I put them down on the table if I think they are going to have trouble standing, if they're going to be motion, I put them on the table and I use that triangle angle sponge. And I'll demonstrate that for you in lab as well, but I find it much easier. What is flail chest? Um, you might see this in the trauma room, but three or more ribs are broken in at least two places. It's usually blunt force. There's a lot of ribs here and it usually requires um, some surgery. So you might see this down in the operating room and usually we get called in to do a portable chest x-ray at the end of one of these cases, uh, the ORF ribs where they're using plates and screws and then they might come in for a two view chest um, as a follow up post-op. The pectus excavatum uh, it's a congenital deformity of the chest wall. It's usually um, causes several ribs to grow in an inward direction. And then it causes the chest to look sort of sunken in. They take these bars in this image here and they actually surgically place them into the chest to open the chest wall up. And you might see these post-op PA and lateral chest like this. That's what those bars are. And that's the end of that.